hi Salil. Lovely. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, being with us today. Uh, Salil Aroskar is the uh, lead uh, cyber risk management uh, manager at uh, Athena Health, which is an uh, uh, IT uh, healthcare IT uh, company. And uh, in previous videos, uh, Salil shared with us his uh, career or interesting career. And also, we have done a few things, a few videos about uh, general introduction to uh, uh, third-party risk management and also uh, about uh, all the process steps you have to set up to actually manage the risk related to a third-party. And uh, today we're going to dive in kind of the, the conclusions of that uh, uh, analysis and uh, also pointers to uh, uh, areas where I think we will have to work together in, in future videos on more in-depth, more specific topics which are emerging today we're going to only uh, have a quick uh, glance at them today but uh, they i think deserve uh, an in-depth uh, review again uh, thanks uh, very much for having for taking the time to to share with us uh, your knowledge uh, so uh, maybe you can uh, uh, kind of uh, launch a topic uh, and maybe one one topic to get started with is uh, a, a terminology which has become very popular especially after COVID and uh, even in, in some parts of the world, like in Europe, uh, uh, in the Ukraine uh, mm. uh, war, is a supply chain related risk. So that means third parties involved in our supply chain. So it's not looking at one particular one, but looking at the more the bigger picture. Maybe you can share uh, your insights on that. And as I said, we will we'll probably have to dive deeper in a proper in, in a future video on that. Yeah, um, yeah, supply chain itself is a beast of a topic, separately. But in general, as I think you rightly mentioned, right, we need to look at the bigger picture in terms of what is our supply chain for addressing a specific or delivering a specific product or delivering a specific service, right? And need to ensure that uh, there is good identification. What are our vendors in that supply chain? Ensure uh, to identify what are the risks in that supply chain and try to address the whole supply chain. These days, third-party risk management, supply chain risk management is also combined with software supply chain risk management. Again, software supply chain is a, a different beast altogether, which can be discussed in further videos. But yeah, overall, we need to understand for delivering a specific services, how many vendors or what all type of vendors are in the whole chain that we are delivering specific services but I think it's uh, as the you know as, as globalization takes place uh, as uh, also uh, certain things uh, involve more specialized companies they, they there is a notion of chains of third parties in some sense who are have each one the different risks are, are, are evolved and when we have geopolitical issues suddenly they important and as you said, in the software side, uh, we never uh, linked third parties to software so much, no. uh, except that they're developing something for us. But nowadays we discover that, you know, we should look at the complete code we are developing and maybe we use so many open source, so many libraries from so many people. No. So uh, uh, it, there is a whole map of third parties uh, to, to, to be made. Yeah. And uh, yeah. any, any, so has your team been more involved with application security uh, to, to do that? Or is that something you are moving now as part of the, uh, of, of, uh, of your future mission? Or, or do you see your, your mission to educate uh, the application security teams to manage uh, third parties? How, how, what's your view on that? I think application security will definitely be a, important point in the whole third-party supply chain uh, risk, right? So uh, when we talk about application security, we need to develop secure applications. Uh, who is developing that applications? What are the components that goes into those applications? Um, is very important to understand. So uh, we need to educate the application security teams or the development teams for that matter to understand uh, what are the risks we are dealing with and how to address those risks much earlier than uh, later. And if we are addressing those risks 
while designing or while doing the testing itself, uh, it will save us a lot of time and effort rather than doing the application security testing just before production release. I think another category uh, which is also worthwhile a future video is uh, the use of external stuff. It's like a third party of one. Sometimes we have seen that not only do we use third parties, but we also use, uh, we have our own internal stuff and we use uh, for stuff augmentation or uh, sometimes for cost reduction also uh, we use, uh, uh, I would call them in this context of our discussion, third party stuff. Of course, we are, or usually refer to them as external in, in, in versus internal stuff, yeah. Uh, but they also, uh, almost uh, follow the same issues. Of course, uh, you may have individual contracts to individual individuals and so on, but you may also have third parties which work for a third party <laughs> <laughs> or external stuff which work for the third party. What is your view on, on this topic? Yeah, I think uh, managing the third party staff or the contract staff uh, is extremely challenging. Uh, right? uh, we need to understand uh, what are they accessing first thing and secondly uh, we need to rely on the third parties who with whom the uh, contract staff are employed with right so it's certain uh, part of partnership with the third parties in terms of how do we manage the contract employees then there are various um, scenarios where the contract parties uh, the contract uh, third parties uh, are also considered as insiders right for example if the third party contractor has access to a inside systems, which um, uh, in many cases they would have, uh, we should ideally consider them as insiders, right? And treat them as insider risk. Right? Uh, similarly, we also have to understand a scenario where an uh, employee becomes a contractor, right? Uh, which we briefly touched upon in previous videos. In that case is also the dealing with the contractor will be different. And in many cases, you would find that a few contractors outlast the employees in the organization. So in that, uh, in those cases, the knowledge that the contractor or the third party employee would have is much more than what our employees may have. Right? So it's again a different way that we need to manage these kind of employees. But at the end of the day, yeah, uh, we need to realize uh, they would still be third party employees and we need to deal them uh, we need to deal with the risks related to third party employees in a slightly different way then let me deal with the employees i think the uh, two points uh, one is and again it's uh, more pointers for future videos so one is um, uh, a very important topic normally we have said when we have a third party as a company we do a risk assessment yeah uh, and uh, i always have struggled uh, to propose that we do also at least the vetting or background checks on the employees yeah because we do not know everybody we hire we can see their cv as much as they it is accurate we can talk to them to see whether they have the right knowledge but they may have worked for many different companies and uh, not everything is went well or even the third the, their third party the companies that worked before may not even be uh, as reputable as the current one and so on so uh, we may know very little about the employee except a few cv related facts but i found that it was very difficult to impose that as a process step but i i, I mean and then we have discussion that this employee is uh, doing sensitive stuff uh, so uh, how far do we want to go because if you are in a company who is uh, doing uh, sensitive data management, you know, I think your customers have a legitimate expectation that you just don't employ just anybody. <laughs> and uh, all the people who work for you are know what, what, what they're doing. I think that's one part. The second one, which is again a part of a future video, is uh, uh, we, we some many times, but not always, many times we have a situation that um, the the employee, so the internal stuff is managed by or through the human resource department. Yeah, but when it comes to external stuff, there is nobody responsible. There is uh, they de they de they depending on line management. And uh, uh, luckily, I have seen a few examples where 
HR has accepted that there's maybe HR department number one for internal stuff and HR department number two uh, dealing with external stuff because they almost have the similar needs. I mean, they don't, they, they're not there for long term, but we, we still have to manage them in, in a good way and, not, and also make sure that they, they, they're treated in a similar way across a company, not uh, differently by line management and so on. And sometimes line management may, may or not be may or may not be well equipped uh, to deal in a proper way with a third party. So there is, a, I would call that a more like a, a structural problem. I mean, who, who, you know, uh, should they report to procurement? Should they be, should we create an extension of the HR department uh, to have a continuous uh, treatment uh, of, of those? I think that is uh, uh, yeah, fundamental items. Any, any other thoughts on that? I think uh, you rightly said, right, uh, if if the third party contractors or third party employees are accessing our sensitive areas or sensitive information, it may be worthwhile to train them on similar to what we train our employees, right? Um, I'm taking a step ahead, right, if they're accessing our really, really sensitive information in terms of our Proprietary information or trademarks uh, or anything, and we, we may want to do the background screening of that contractor rather than rely on the third party. It, it all depends on what the person is accessing, uh, right, and how we manage them. And managing them it's, again, it's a different thing, as we mentioned, right? You know, it may not be we may not be in the complete control of managing the third party employees. Maybe the last item, uh, which is uh, extends a bit the notion of third party, we have seen the supply chain, which extends it. We have the the stuff, external stuff, which extends the notion of third party. The last uh, item, which which does the same, is the management of merger and acquisition. Yeah, so acquisition would be we buy a company and it becomes part of the mother company yeah, at some point. What what does it mean? Uh, we uh, could merge with a company and we become one. And uh, normally uh, there is uh, not only acquisition, but also the sale of uh, part of it. We mentioned that in the previous video. There are uh, situations where one, one part is a third party at the beginning or at the end or at, at uh, some point or another, and then becomes part of the company or, or ceases to be part of the company. So. The, the what we can do or the laws of engagement uh, from a risk management point of view are, are quite unique uh, to these situations I mentioned. Uh, any, uh, what, what are you, your views uh, on that? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, mergers and acquisition is a different ball game altogether. Um, the business uh, or the top management should also decide when to involve information security departments very closely. Right. In terms of acquisitions, we need to understand uh, the timeline where the real acquisition would happen and how the uh, ad co -ad company would merge with our environment. We need to extend our security controls to the uh, acquired company as such and give them some time to implement those security measures as well. Right. So, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a different ballgame altogether, but Again, the mergers and acquisitions are increasing a lot um, these days, right? And also, hive off and um, selling off some certain part of the companies is also increasing a lot. So it's worthwhile to have a separate discussion on the whole M and A risk management. I would say. I think the uh, uh, the the challenging part, I think, uh, in my experience on acquisitions was always that we we part of the due diligence of the acquisition, we need to give an opinion whether there are risks associated uh, or implicit risk or intrinsic risk uh, which are associated with a third party. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we, if, as it is due diligence, it's happening at a point where the company has not been acquired yet and uh, there may be still discussions going on and uh, the final documents have not been signed or even the final uh, pricing has not been agreed. So uh, the challenge was all is always that we have to do a, we have to do the due diligence and that's typically accepted by that the party which is acquired. But we have to be very 
we cannot do very uh, rough and tough uh, investigation. And uh, if we would do it, um, it's possible that this would uh, impact negatively the spirit of the acquisition. Yeah, we, we yeah. need both parties to feel positive about uh, joining forces and, and building a better future. So we we typically have to be how to do it when you cannot do your work uh, so precisely. Not only is it do we have to be careful and therefore there's limits to the quality of our assessment, but the second point is, uh, you know, typically when we find things, we we have to estimate the, the amount of remediation that is required and we have to give the at least the acquiring party some idea of the most likely investment required to to remediate the risks which we estimate so that this is part of the acquisition cost and there's a budget that after the acquisition which is reserved to actually remediate things also that is uh, something which needs to be uh, talked about and uh, as I mentioned before, in the uh, when we sell a third party, selling uh, depends what we sell. But uh, if we, I have been involved in uh, sales of uh, factories. Yeah, uh, that is very very complicated because uh, a factory is tied into marketing and sales. It's tied into product development. It's tied to financially. So it's like. Uh, you remove my arm and my arm is connected to mm, with the blood vessels to my heart and the nerves to my brain. And and uh, uh, nobody has an inventory because uh, they we nothing was built to actually be removed that part. So you have to investigate uh, how, what are the ties, what are the dependencies and uh, how clean a cut you can do or how long it will take. I think that is uh, also another interesting thing. And of course, uh, mergers is when, you know, suddenly who is in charge and uh, what will we become uh, is uh, another important one. So I think uh, uh, good topics also for more in-depth video. Another, yeah, another thing which often uh, missed out is when during mergers and acquisitions are uh, the culture of risk that goes beyond cybersecurity cultural risk because the cultures are not fitting. We are looking at a lot of operational risks that may happen. So we need to visualize those. We need to assess the operational risk after the merger. Uh, super. I mean, I'm, I think uh, we have uh, three big topics. And I'm certainly looking forward to dive into those because they are modern topics. I mean, we talked about solid risk, third party risk management in, in, in a culture where the number of third parties increase. And we have to do much more work than in the past uh, on this, and we have to invest more resources. But then we have also the last three topics we mentioned in this show uh, about, uh, uh, which are also uh, newer or emerging topics uh, and uh, uh, need to be uh, managed by the risk management department in a good way, but probably in a very significantly different way than a typical third party. So thank you very much, uh, Salil. Uh, it was, as always, it was a pleasure to dive deep into uh, these topics uh, with you and uh, 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 looking forward to go also in these uh, new topics in any future video. So thanks, thanks again. Really appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. pleasure talking. <laughs>